last session for today. Um, we will be watching or visiting with Ben Muldrow. He is going to be uh, presenting Telling Your Community Story, Branding, Marketing, and How to Adapt to a Crisis. Just a few things that I need to get out of the way before we turn it over to Ben. Um, this is a Teams presentation that is being recorded. It's a live presentation. It will be available on IEDA's website next week. Um, you may use the Q&A box to answer, to ask any questions throughout the presentation. And uh, Ben will go ahead and be addressing those as we go. And we'll also save a little bit of time at the end. So thank you for tuning in. And at this point, we're going to turn it over to Ben. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. I know this is the final in, in what has been uh, two filled days with sessions and um, really excited to have joined you earlier today in our conversation with Kennedy Smith. Um, so today, I, I, quick introduction, I'm Ben Muldrow, Arnett Muldrow and Associates. We're a urban planning firm that specializes in downtown revitalization, downtown master planning and, and community branding. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit about telling your community story and the importance of branding your place. I think that this is uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to jump right into the presentation and, and um, as Carol said, please feel free to ask questions along the way and I will I'll see those pop up and we'll kind of hit that stuff. But I am going to move pretty quick because I have got almost 300 slides to share with you today. So we're going to we're going to see if we can jump right in. Um, so over the past 20 years, I've had the privilege of working with over 600 communities in 40 states and five countries developing community branding systems. Uh, these brands are important elements for uh, being able to preserve the character of the community. And, and as an urban planning firm, the reason that we got into this work in the first place was we got frustrated with communities that had these plans and had they didn't implement they were great ideas and they went and just gathered dust and we figured out that if we help the citizens fall in love with that plan that we could then in turn increase the implementation of the plan and um, in that time we have had the privilege of working all over the country these are uh, 12 or so examples right there in Iowa that we've worked with we had the privilege of working with the Iowa Main Street program for quite a few years first community we ever worked with uh, there in Iowa was West Branch and uh, have had the privilege of kind of working north to south east to west and and seeing amazing things throughout the state I'll never forget Get, being in Fort Madison and, and they've got this amazing bridge that kind of crosses over the, the railroad tracks and um, I was on that bridge taking photos and I saw a, a train carrying coal moving one direction and a train carrying a wind turbine blade going the other and it was such a kind of picturesque moment of capturing both the the history and future of energy and the role that that um, our heartland plays in that so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about why we brand. I'm going to talk about uh, some rules of how to do it well and how not to do it. I'm going to share with you some case studies and then also give you some examples of some adaptations and messages that might be relevant here in the middle of a global pandemic. So um, I think it is important for us to start with the very simple question, why do we brand? And to illustrate this, we always talk about celebrating a kid's birthday. So in the 1940s, you would have gone to your local grocer, you would have spent about 50 cents, bought some flour and eggs and sugar and, and gone home and made a cake. And then by the 60s, you're gonna go to that local grocer and you're gonna buy a, a box of mix and spend about $2. By the 80s, we're going to a chain grocery store where we're buying a quarter sheet cake with those kind of creepy plastic clown heads, spending about 10 bucks. And, and now in the 2000s, we're, we're renting, you know, $500 Fortnite trailers and having video game, you know, it's kind of this perfect encapsulation of our evolution from a raw material economy, then into a product-based economy, a service economy. And now we are firmly, firmly planted in the experience economy. That experience economy is driving everything like our, our attraction to social media, but it is also driving our focus on branding, the relationship that people have between products or the relationship that people have between themselves and places. 
So with that, I always like to share this definition um, that I have. Branding is the discovery and preservation of a community's personality. A community does not get branded. That brand exists. That personality is inherent. And one of the greatest things you can do is you can acknowledge community branding as a preservation process. You can acknowledge that when you go through this process of discovery, you are identifying the qualities that your citizens cherish and you are integrating them into a system of communication so that you can truly preserve those qualities. And believe it or not, you will find that if you deliberately communicate that and show the values that you are wrapping your arms around, you begin to whittle away at people's reticence for change. People aren't scared of change. They're scared of disconnection. They don't want to live in a place that they don't feel comfortable with anymore. They don't want to, it is their home. They expect to know it. So being able to show them that as you grow and change, these are the things you hold dear. We have found that it really greases those wheels and it makes people a lot more receptive to new ideas. So the goal that you are shooting for in a community is to create brand equity. That's value. What does that mean? And I, I, this is a, a great way to kind of illustrate this. I, I always put this picture of this Mercedes sports utility vehicle uh, up on the screen right before the presentation started. We were talking a little bit about vehicles and cars. And um, I oftentimes ask the audience, how much do you think that this car costs? And overwhelmingly, the answer that we get is $60,000. Well, so what happens when you find out that this Mercedes sports utility vehicle is actually a Kia? Well, guess what? It's no longer worth $60,000. It's the exact same vehicle. It really has the exact same functions, exact same features, leather, Bluetooth. But when you pull up to a red light in a Mercedes, the people around you think something about you. When you pull up in a Kia, they think something slightly different. Neither is right nor wrong. It's simply acknowledging that difference and being able to acknowledge that personality that your community has and use it to your advantage. Those are the things that are going to make business owners take a little bit more risk, might have merchants stay open a little bit later. It might have investors go in and, and you know, put a little bit of extra effort in to, to make that project nice. It might make citizens put in a little more effort to make their place beautiful. So brand equity is that goal to help your community create its true potential. So I learned long ago that when you want to say that you're an expert in something, you have to have rules. So I'm going to share with you my five rules for community branding. Rule number one is the khaki rule say no to design by committee. Um, if we were to all sit around a table and decide one and only one outfit that we as a community would wear for the rest of our lives, we all know we would end up in a pair of khaki pants. We would probably end up in some sort of polo shirt and by the end of the day, we would end up looking like we work at Best Buy. Um, compromise is not the best way to capture character. And this design by committee is a really great way to take a good idea and remove every compelling facet from it. Uh, here's a, an example that I'd like to share from Kittitas County, Washington. Kittitas County is just east of Snoqualmie Pass. This is the place where the gray of Seattle, the clouds and rain of Seattle stop and the color of nature and the sun reemerges. So we came up with this whole idea of live life in color. This, this it, invitation for folks that needed to get out of the doldrums and come experience nature once again. And the committee loved the idea. They loved the concept, but then they started to pick it apart. And the first thing that they said was, well, nobody knows where Kittitas County is. So maybe our logo should be a map of the state. You don't have to do that. Um, good word of warning to everybody. You don't have to have a map of Iowa as your logo with a star where you're located. 
Um, then the next thing that, of course, if you've ever worked on the county level, they said, well, we've got a lot of different communities, so we need to make sure that we list all of them so that nobody feels left out. And the, the quote, inclusiveness just made the design worse and worse. And finally, once they reached this point, uh, somebody on the committee said, I I'm not really sure whether you realize it or not, but we've kind of ruined everything that was good about what was recommended. And luckily, they did go back to the original design. But always remember this idea of design by committee. What is the motivation there? The motivation there is to include many voices. The inclusion of many voices is essential in a branding process. But the inclusion of those voices needs to have happen in the front end of the process, it needs to happen in the data collection and the identification of the character. It doesn't need to happen at the end when you're trying to figure out what your logo should be. That's like inviting 12 of your closest acquaintances to come in and decide what color you should paint your living room. Never ends well. So be mindful of avoiding that process and always be comfortable with the idea that sticking out of the crowd means that it might not always be completely comfortable with every single person. With a process like this, there are two things to really think about. You want to make sure that you have that engagement on the front end, just like I had talked about. The goal of combining that engagement with your branding recommendations sets up the opportunity for you to inspire the community. If you leave with an inspired people, then you now have a, a community that is truly empowered to realize their own visions and their own future. And that really is a, a goal of this process. Rule number two, the contest rule. Please don't use design contest to design your community brand. It does not end well. Uh, believe it or not, this is actually a city logo from a community in India. Um, we can't say a lot of good things about this logo. There is a lot going on. Um, we might give them points for, I guess, thoroughness. Um, everything from windmills to airplanes to first aid crosses to ships to rocket ships, you know, they have included every single bit of it. But this is a great illustration of telling us when you try to say everything, oftentimes you say very little. Um, I would challenge you to even see if you can figure out what the community's name is, because believe it or not, it's the smallest type on the entire logo. Uh, it's Kakinada, and um, it is really, really difficult to get much about this community out of this logo. One of the other things that we always talk about is, is what we call the uniqueness test. There are a lot of consultants out there that try to convince a community that their goal is to craft a unique statement that no one else can make. And I have a real issue with that recommendation. I disagree with it completely. Um, your job, yes, you do need to accentuate your competitive advantages. That is important. You do not need to try to craft a message that no one else can say, because there is a fine line between a message that no one else can say and a message that no one else wants to say. Um, we've seen some amazing examples from around the country. This is La Crosse, Kansas, the barbed wire capital of the world. That's a, a great way to welcome folks in, isn't it? Um, stick around in Kansas for gas, Kansas. Don't pass gas, stop and enjoy it. I wish that this was a joke, but it's not. Hooker, Oklahoma, it's a location, not a vocation. Now you might think that this can't be real, but honestly, this community, their sports teams are the horny toads and the senior center sells once a hooker, always a hooker t-shirts as fundraisers. Um, now I was once asked, you know, isn't any marketing good marketing? And I would argue that there needs to be a marketing that is based in true pride and being able to have your community taken seriously. It, it, it is always good to make fun of yourself, but it's also always good to have the appropriate outfit for the appropriate conversation, shall we say. And then finally, 
this example from Colorado, Severance, Colorado, where the geese fly and the bulls cry. Now, I'll be honest, I had absolutely no clue what that meant. Um, having worked in Wyoming and, and knowing that this was kind of beef ranching uh, area, I thought that maybe they had some sort of beef slaughter facility there. Uh, come to find out the the truth was that it was uh, it was even worse than that. They are the home of Bruce's Bar, and Bruce's is known for Rocky Mountain oysters. And if you're not familiar with those, those are bull testicles. So literally the entire community has wrapped their personality around, you got it, bull testicles. Rule number three, the seal rule. Do not use your city seal as your marketing tool. It's just not the right tool. This example is from the village of Whitesboro, New York. Uh, the folks that live there absolutely guarantee that this is a, uh, a native and a settler engaging in a fun game of Indian wrestling. Um, when asked several years ago uh, when it was suggested that this might not necessarily be sensitive or appropriate anymore, um, they decided to allow the village to vote. Um, and of course they voted to keep it. Uh, so you need to be real mindful. Seals are important graphic tools in the life of a community, but they are not the marketing tool. I'll share with you a couple of examples. This is one from uh, Salisbury, Maryland. And again, they definitely deserve credit for thoroughness. They fit pumpkins, uh, tomatoes, haystacks, cucumbers, apples, strawberries, beans, sailboat, pine tree, college line building, street light road, and building line street. Um, so again, winning points for thoroughness. If you look at the top right quadrant, of that seal where you see the, what appears to be 11 story buildings. Um, we heard from Kennedy Smith twice today. This uh, Salisbury is her hometown. She would tell you that there are no 11 story buildings in downtown Salisbury, but uh, that particular graphic affectionately became known as the Death Star Trench. So I guess you do win points if you make a Star Wars reference. So, we also go back to my home state and I get to share with you one of um, one of the worst seals I think I've ever seen. Um, this particular graphic, you can tell six people got to sit around the table and design it. Each one got to come up with a word. Um, you know, it's always back to, better with a tractor on it. So we've got our agriculture. We've got those clip art Christmas trees for our industry. And look at how much fun recreation appears to be. Um, no, they're not on the ocean, so not exactly sure what those waves are. But I think the thing that is most striking to the seal of St. Stephen, South Carolina, is their patriotism. Um, so patriotic, in fact, that they included the head and legs of an American eagle. Um, this is that perfect encapsulation of when you try to say everything, you say nothing. That carries us on to rule four, the screwdriver rule. You must have the right tool for the job. Now, this is a very, very big lesson that we learned from colleges and universities, and it is so relevant to both our communities and our downtown districts. Colleges and universities understand that there is a difference between their academic brand and their athletic brand. They're similar they share colors, but they do not want a bad year in football to affect their admissions. So there is just enough graphic difference between them to be able to preserve the individuality. Just like that in our communities, we need to think about the difference between destination brands and organization brands. Oftentimes our CVB or our city or our chamber has a logo and they use their organization logo to promote the place. Oftentimes our Main Street organizations have a logo and they use their logo to promote the downtown. You need to have an open source shared community identity for that destination brand. And then you as an organization connect to it. Very, very important to learn. And then rule five, the heart of the gateway to the hub of it all. Um, this is just a simple idea that a lot of communities seem to dabble with. This idea of 
announcing themselves as the gateway to this or the heart of that. When you sit there and do that, what you are actually doing is you are transferring the control of your brand to another identity. We talked a little bit about Salisbury, Maryland already. They had a tagline that they were using, the heart of Delmarva. Well, when you say that you're the heart of Delmarva, you are now depending on Delmarva to mean something good. You are depending on controlling that other identity. Just remember, a gateway is something that you pass through to get to where you want to go. Make yourself the destination. Be very mindful of connecting yourself. I, I found this when I was speaking down in Georgia. Uh, they have Folkestone, Georgia, gateway to Okefenokee Swamp, and Fargo, Georgia, gateway to Okefenokee Swamp. So you always kind of think, hey, this is a really great marketing skill, but what you're doing is you're taking advantage of pre-existing brand and trying to make it elevate your own. And in a community tagline or a positioning concept, that can be hard for you at times. So with that, just kind of a brief overview, one of the things that we really believe that you need to focus in on is the creation of a brand toolbox for your community. In that brand toolbox, it typically contains four main elements, a defined color palette, uniform typefaces, a consistent message, and a, an approach to graphics. And I'm gonna share with you some examples now. Uh, one of the first is one of my absolute favorites. This is from a community, Opelousas, Louisiana. Opelousas is uh, a small community outside of uh, Lafayette, and um, they are the home of Tony uh, Chattery's uh, seasoning. I'm sure that, that many of you have probably seen Tony Chattery's. They are uh, known to be kind of the leader in Cajun and Creole seasonings. They're also the home of a company called Savoy's. Savoy's makes more jarred roux, which is a basic uh, kind of ingredient for, for uh, Cajun cooking. Um, they are the home of Zydeco music. Uh, they were the home of a man named Clifton Chinois who invented the rub board. So a lot of really, really interesting stories. But then one of the other things that they were really proud of is that they were the third oldest community in Louisiana. And I always kind of make fun. I was like, you know, third oldest, that's pretty big. You know, I've heard there's a trend of people traveling state to state, visiting the third oldest community in each state. Um, it's one of those things where that is a facet of your story that you have to figure out how to tell. Now, when we came into Opelousas, their logo was a fleur-de-lis. And uh, if you're not familiar with a fleur-de-lis, it is a, um, it's a French symbol that kind of symbolizes a, an ear of corn. Um, it is the New Orleans Saints logo, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it's ubiquitous with both Cajun and Creole cultures. And um, it's one of those things that the community could never own it, not just as a simple Florida lead. That's an icon. It, it symbolizes too many things that can't be yours. So how can we create something that could truly be Opelousas? So the first thing that we did was we look at their name and, and you always need to think about your community name, not just as its name, but also think about it as a graphic because being able to consistently say your name is the basics of being able to stitch together all these different messages. So what we have is we have three different or four different styles here. The top is called title style. Then we see what's called down style, then small caps and all caps. And with these, we see different uh, graphic structures on these. There is no right or wrong. There's just an intentional decision. We leaned towards the, the title style at the top. I really liked how the single P descender uh, gave me a space to put a tagline, and I liked the couple holes up front that would allow me a place to put graphics. So then from there, we started to look at different typefaces, and we landed on this. And we knew it's a script typeface. Scripts are not particularly easy to read. But we also knew that Opelousas was not an easy name for people to know. We wanted to slow people down and make everything very, very deliberate. And then here you also see the introduction of this very, very simple tagline, perfectly seasoned. 
that perfectly seasoned allows us to talk about not just our connection to cre Creole and Cajun foods, but our connection to that seasoned music, that flavor of Zydeco that is so much what people think of when they think of, of Louisiana. And then, of course, we have that connection to that third oldest community, that amazing history, that perfect seasoning and in, in the story to tell. And then from there, we wanted to create a stylized icon. And with that icon, we were able to bring that Florida Lee back in as a connection with the history. We brought in a seasoning shaker for the connection to the food and both a fiddle and a keyboard accordion, which was particularly prevalent in both Zydeco and Prairie country. Um, and those build in to create this system perfectly seasoned with seasoned sounds, seasoned flavors, and seasoned culture. Uh, had a question that just came in. Uh, what is the smallest community you've ever done brand work for? As you see these things, we get asked that question often. Um, I think that they think because things are so deliberate and we do focus in so much on the storytelling, it must be something for extremely large communities. Uh, believe it or not, I just developed a brand system for a community of 178 people. Um, we have several communities we've worked with that are sub 1000 people and the overwhelming majority of our communities have been somewhere between 8,000 and 25,000. So uh, this is very much not just a process for a big city, but one of the important things to remember is you have to scale the process to be appropriate for your community and you have to scale the budget to be appropriate for your community. A community of a couple thousand is not going to have the same revenue potential as a community of 250,000. So hopefully that helps. So we jump back into Opelousas. So now we see all of this kind of come together into the overarching brand system. And then the first thing that we wanted to do as we launched the brand was we wanted to remind the locals why this place is special. And we launched this campaign, it is great to be us. And just looking inside yourself and seeing the community from a different facet. It is amazing how a perfectly formulated brand system can absolutely be demolished by a negative self-esteem from a community. So you always want to start with the local first. You want to bump up that community pride. Then another thing that I really like is I like very intentional gestures. As we went through this process, we do a lot of input meetings. Um, we would always ask folks, so if you were describing Opelousas as a color, what color would it be? And, and I'll be honest, that answer doesn't always elicit great responses. I mean, a lot of times people will be like, well, I feel like we're we're blue and green because we have trees and, and a sky, you know? And it's like, okay, I, I get it. In Opelousas, the answer was so very different. People would say, well, we're, we're not quite paprika. And it's like, what are you talking about? And finally we figured it out. Somebody was like, you know, the color I think of when I think of Opelousas is the color, color of Tony Satchery's seasoning. So we went back to the grocery store that night. We bought a can of the seasoning. I, I poured it out on the little plastic tray in the bathroom and, and took this photo of it. And this photo, that color and that texture became the background for our billboards, for our ads, for our brochures. So now all of a sudden there is this amazingly subtle gesture that is built in to our stories. Now, do I expect the normal person to look at this and just say, oh, look at that. They use Tony's as background. Absolutely not. This is one of the things that we call a springboard for storytelling. It's those little hidden features that allow citizens to tell the story of their place and turn into evangelists for that place. So very important to have them talking about the place they call home. And then I always like to talk a little bit about this guy. His name is Joe Citizen. 
we um we often talk generically about Joe Citizen as you know just the generic member of the community and he came up to me afterwards he was like hey just wanted to let you know my name is Joe Citizen it's nice to meet you and I was like man it's so nice to finally meet you we've been talking about you for years but Joe was the connection to the Zydeco culture we knew that it did not matter if they were the birthplace of Zydeco music if you couldn't hear it and now you can go to Opelousas and you can hear live Zydeco music six days a week. So it's absolutely phenomenal to see how that has become not just a story, but an experience. So from that, I'm going to pick up the pace and, and talk a little bit more because uh, we're about halfway through. Um, I'm going to give you a couple other case studies from other places throughout the, the country. And if you do have questions, please feel free to jump right in. Um, one of the first things that I do anytime I go into a community is I create a slide like this that just kind of collects some of the pre-existing logos and identities from the community. This is from Elkins, West Virginia. And we were fortunate enough to come in and we were working directly with their Main Street organization in their downtown. Um, we went through there, the home of Davis and Elkins College. So anytime you have a college, you need to understand that your college or university probably is one of the most savvy branders in your community. So you need to, to be very mindful of how you're going to coordinate and live alongside those branding efforts. Um, want to remind that idea of the organization and the destination logo with those those toolboxes. Um, we like to talk a little bit about the brand values, the things that we heard from folks that they were excited about. Um, one of the things that we heard that was so very interesting in Elkins is anytime if you live in the Washington DC market, you hear about Elkins because Elkins is unbelievably, there's something about the geography there that it, it captures cold. And it oftentimes is 20 to 25 degrees colder in Elkins, West Virginia, than it is in, in Washington, D.C., which is a mere two hours away. So they knew that they had very high awareness into the Washington, D.C. market, and they knew that people knew that they were cold, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. So we created a color palette. The color palette was inspired between blending together both the pre-existing brand for the city and the pre-existing brand from the college. Um, we wanted to make sure that they realized that just because they were outdoorsy did not mean that they had to use a font that looked like logs. Uh, we scared a couple people with that the first time. Um, they had heavy, heavy logging history and timber related history there, but um, we were trying to show them how to be sophisticated and savvy. So we landed with this word type where we could consistently show Elkins, got this really great kind of texture to it. And then we just kind of showed this nice artistic upgraded feel to a forest and this great tagline, unexpectedly cool. So with this, kind of go through the downtown brand with the unexpectedly cool, different size variations and complexities, testing it out to make sure that it works in one color and simplifies down, showing how that unexpectedly cool can expand, truly historic, unexpectedly cool. This starts to create a stage for additional headline adaptations and, and expanded uh, ideas and, and concepts there. Um, Let's see. And then we look at that organization brand. Um, and this is that Main Street organization. And here we we position them as the cultivator for cool. And I think that's a really, really interesting role for an organization to play. Um, so I think I've got a, a question that came in and this is a great time to kind of hit on it. Our community branding had early buy-in but is just picking up steam outside the community. But now there's a small group of loud voices that want us to change our logo. How would you address that? So one of the things that I think you really have to be mindful of is um, whenever you, you build a system, whenever you kind of adopt a system, you have to realize that it, it's going to grow and adapt. Um, there, there is no fixed or regimented rollout strategy. Um, there's certain elements that have some flex to it and there's certain ones that don't. 
But the fact is, you have to earn its ability to stick around through implementation. Um, if you kind of eke it out bit by bit um, and, and then not really establish that true use, then you immediately draw the, the opposition or you draw folks with different opinions, you know, to a certain degree. And I don't know what community this is coming from. So obviously I don't have any background on whether it's a yay or nay, but you know, you have to kind of ask yourself about the group that's asking for change. Um, is their point valid or is it not valid? Is it is it changeable or is it not changeable? And are they just contrarian? Um, and I think that as we keep going through, I'll see if I can hit on some of those similar topics because I have a couple examples out there of folks that maybe have been uh, a little frustrated or there have been some iterations during the process. Now, Elkins is one of those communities where they've done a great job with implementation. They've gone through and gotten this out both from the organization side and the community side. And they've started to really see that the community has started to build their own self-esteem around this. Um, we showed how they can use very simple typeface adaptations and adopting the font to be able to bring these organizations under the umbrella while protecting their own individuality. But then one of the big things that we always focus in on is what we call brand extension. And this is how you can use those colors and typefaces to wrap your arms around the events that go on in the community. So they're the home of the Mountain State Forest Festival. Um, we launched First Fridays, which was a great music event. And if you go online, they have used this uh, so much. Uh, First Friday's Jazz Walk. Uh, they did a bunch of cash mobs when that was first fresh and new. Uh, the Scarecrow Festival, where they go and do artistic scarecrows on their poles during um, October. Uh, Trick or treat downtown. So again, you start to see these things are stitched together, but they're also preserving individuality. Sometimes we come through and, and actually see the need for a new event, and we actually recommended what we called Cabin Fever Brewfest, which was an event that started to bring in folks from the surrounding cabin rentals that were all throughout this region and starting to make Elkins kind of the hometown for the cabin vacation rental, uh, tapping into that economy through an event. So you start to see now the, the system is connected, the colors create that continuity, and you start to earn the equity through all the events that you have. Then we look at things like collateral materials, making it out to the, the business cards, historic design pattern books, uh, things like quilt trails. I was privileged enough to work with Donna Sue Groves up in, in Athens, Ohio, who was the originator of the, the quilt trail or the quilt barns, uh, where she did the first one in honor of her mother and um, was able to see this grow throughout the country. So these quilt trails are, are huge amenities. Uh, we look at things like wayfinding signage and figuring out ways that you can integrate that brand into a system that's going to last the multiple years that a, a wayfinding system is intended to and also qualify for the, the DOT standards through this amazing publication called the MUTCD. So a little bit of, um, of engineering that goes into it. Uh, we like to design street banners and use those to help people learn about the district. So that starts to show you a little more what a full system might look like. Now with this, I wanna jump through and I wanna share a little bit about communication during crisis. Um, we had the privilege of working with all of the Main Street programs in the state of Michigan. And um, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I think we've heard so much about this, but one of the big things that is important, especially during the time of COVID, is realizing that you don't necessarily want to slap your logo on everything. Um, we know that there are consumers that are, some are comforted by efforts to enhance safety while others feel violated 
by those efforts. So being able to create tools that are helpful for businesses while also not necessarily overly tying any individual organization was a really huge goal. So what we did was we launched a Love My Downtown campaign. And the whole purpose of this Love My Downtown campaign was this opportunity to create a basket to hold our COVID-related design responses for these Main Street programs. So we created everything from open signs to uh, shop safe decals. And you might have seen some of these with Jay Schlensog, who spoke yesterday. I was priv privileged to work with him on the Reopen Main Street website and then the adaptations for Michigan. Um, all of these kind of safe store signage um, and being able to go through, highlight your curbside and your delivery and, and all the different gestures. But as you can see, we're protecting that local organization where they don't necessarily have to slap their logo on everything. Provide the support while also providing the organizational protection. And then we shared some things like this, social media. Um, this is actually a really great tool for your community where you could kind of take this. It's just a, a simple flat image file that people can integrate into their stories on Facebook or Instagram, and they can type on top of it the favorite place to eat, favorite place to shop. It's a great way to give people an opportunity to interact with the community. And then also just fitting that into the marketing message. So again, I said I wasn't going to spend too long on it. This is one of those dynamics where um, we've got a lot of important messaging that needs to be conveyed. Be very mindful as a business which ones you want to directly own and which ones you want to lean on the other organizations to kind of be the deliverer of that message per se. So we're going to jump from there into a great example for a very small community. This is 1,800 people in northern Michigan. It's called Grayling. Uh, this was their logo when we came in. Um, it was affectionately known as Daffy Duck in a Canoe. And if you take a second and look at that, you can kind of see the duck bill uh, off to the side. Once you see the duck, you can't unsee the duck. Um, so they asked very much to, to have something different. They're a community where canoeing is very important to them. They are the home of something called the Canoe Marathon. It is a 100-mile uh, canoe race that starts in Grayling and goes all the way down to Oscoda, Michigan. And um, they wanted to incorporate and keep imagery like that into their community. So the first thing that we did was we created an overarching community destination brand. Uh, a Grayling is a fish. So we created this stylized G with the grayling fish along the bottom, which has a really, really interesting back uh, fin. So we made sure to kind of accentuate that and still incorporated both the river and the canoe. Introduced this simple tagline, naturally colorful, uh, going through and kind of creating these different stylized variations. You see the word type and, and the use of colors. But then we see with the city brand itself for the organization, we created a much simpler, much cleaner version of a man in a canoe that does not look like Daffy Duck. Then with our downtown, we created a version for the downtown itself, uh, itself positioning it as Michigan's most colorful river town, uh, creating all those different design variations with using the simple iconic nature of a paddle or a canoe. And then that Main Street brand, where we're again accentuating and using four colors in that icon system to highlight on the four point approach of Main Street. I actually ended up adapting this a little bit for their final version. So those are actually uh, paddle ends, the, the end of a, an oar instead of just a kind of a nondescript. They wanted it to be a little bit more literal reference. So uh, with their final version, you can tell that those are paddles. So again, seeing those different variations tying into organization, economic vitality, design, and uh, promotion, they call them events. Uh, now, one of the beautiful things in Grayling is this community had some of the most creative events that I have ever seen. Um, they actually build a pool, an above ground pool on their main street, 
put a canoe in it and they put two people facing each other and they paddle towards each other and it's almost like tug of war and that's called paddle battle and they literally do it during the month of march they do a 64 uh team breakdown like march madness so there's this great event that happens all during the day and people just absolutely love it um they do some kind of interesting things where we had created a whole series that we were calling the night out um they started as many downtown programs did with a girls night out but we created what we called the colorful night out and it was a different series where each month would have a color theme and they would celebrate all different products that were on sale they would decorate their windows in that color so kind of getting that creativity to fit um, and then one of the coolest events that they are just getting around to is what they called paddle putt putt and they created a series of small um putt putt holes but you had to go through and you had to do them with a, a boat paddle instead of a, a putter um, so great ways to take the brand make it fit whether they're making it fit programmatically whether they're making it fit uh design wise like the christmas walk with the paddles and the the snowflake from there we jump over to oregon this is a, a slightly larger community uh, that's a suburb of uh the portland metro troutdale um, this is their current logo. They had a couple different versions that were kind of rolling around there. Troutdale is an absolutely fantastic community. Um, we always go through and again, we actually pulled the color palette from uh, images of rainbow trout that would be found in the stream surrounding the community. Um, we identified the typefaces there for the first time ever. We actually adopted a typeface just for art efforts in the community. So this kind of script typeface at the bottom was used for all art based initiatives and art organizations, which is kind of a cool, um, a cool take on that, something that we had never really done before. So here you see that word type. And then the next thing that we did that I think was really interesting was we actually talked about these values and wrote a statement, almost like a brand statement per value. We talked about how they were shaped by the forces of the water and the wind and the land, how they are rooted in their history and their native peoples and their discovery stories, how they are on the home of the Union Pacific Railroad and the, the Great Columbia River Highway and the transportation infrastructure that, that is so much of their origin story and how they have this amazing trestle bridge right in their downtown that, that highlights their connectiveness to one another and this blood that overlooks the whole community and the gateway to the the Columbia Gorge and all of those values kind of went in and and highlighted this place called Troutdale and um, then we introduced that idea and this tagline our nature will move you so very simple concepts but they're all grounded in those values that they cherished so again, you can kind of see how this starts to grow together. In this particular community, they have been known as the gateway to the gorge for years. So we wanted to solidify that as the moniker. And then we also wanted to change, you know, create that gateway to the gorge is a message that stuck around forever. And this tagline, which is a lot more adaptable. And that kind of goes back to the question that we just got. You know, if your brand does not have the ability to grow and adapt, then you're always going to be faced with that constant battle of some people that are ready for it to change and others that say it need to to stay the same one of the things that we loved about a system like this is it allowed for that growth and adaptation with time now again we talked a little bit about the importance of gateway to the gorge having a system that worked and simplified down trying to connect it in with the art that was present there in the community then we start digging into the organization itself um, I am uh, I'm digging into uh, the city seal, being able to create something that's a little bit more stylish, a little bit a little bit different from what they're used to, um, but highlighting the the 
elements that built up that whole storyline for them. Uh, we actually went through and created variations for each one of their departments. We helped to use colors to organize the, the organizational structure of the city government itself. Um, we streamlined and created consistency in their email signature, which was something that they were desperate for. Just those simple, simple dynamics. But then we also helped them to launch a Main Street program in their community and, and how to position that. They're, they're a community that didn't have a historic downtown, but had kind of built one in the 80s. And now they're they're dealing with what to do now. So they've got this, this town center alliance. Um, again, we talked about the brand extension. This is a major redevelopment site right on the, the Columbia River, uh, right next to a giant outlet mall, which is what you see to the left. And then if you were to travel um, south, if we're looking, say, looking north, if you look down the row of buildings across the railroad tracks, that is the backside of their current downtown. So this is a huge opportunity for them. We actually wrote an entire brand statement for this opportunity site. The time is now, the opportunity is here, the vision is bold. We named the site Confluence at Troutdale, and we really wanted to position this as a very, very important element in the life of their community. Um, up until this point, they had called it the uh, community development uh, redevelopment site. And it's like, okay, that's not exactly exciting. Um, so again, the event extension, being able to take those colors, those typefaces, fit them in to those logos, into those events, connect together and stitch together. We see this is the arts in action with all the different arts initiatives, everything from um, they have a thing that they call art trout, which is like artistic fish throughout the community. We urge the arts organizations to come together and create a public art master plan, utilizing art as an economic catalyst, driving pedestrians through the community. Uh, this particular community is the home of a world renowned bronze sculptor. So there are sculptures all throughout the community. The next thing that we really worked on with them was the creation of what we called the Sculptural Signs Program, starting to turn signage into a true art showcase in their community. And then the Vibrant Troutdale Program, which was just a vibrancy grant like I had talked about earlier today. Even things like walking trails, they were known for smelt, which is a very small fish. Um, they used to catch so much smelt right here in Troutdale that they supplied um, SeaWorld in San Diego with all their feeder fish. It was absolutely stunning to hear these stories. So figuring out creative ways that you can wrap your arms around that. Um, again, brand collateral. I'm going to go super fast through this. I am going to share this whole presentation with you all through the PDF and, and upload this file for you. Um, but knowing that I only have about um, seven or eight minutes left before we can wrap up on time, I just want to share a couple other communities with you that I think are really, really fun. Um, there are included in here everything like brand implementation checklists, um, a page like this on how community members can be a brand partner. There's a page that allows you to score your own brand implementation for Main Street. So some really, really great tools for you to dig into. But the couple I always like to wrap on, first, this is Hollister, California. Um, if you've ever heard of Hollister, California, you might have seen it in a local shopping mall. It's actually a brand that is owned by Abercrombie & Fitch. It is the only city I've ever worked with that has been sued by a major corporation for making t-shirts with their own name on them. Um, Abercrombie actually owns the copyright for apparel for Hollister, California. So obviously we went into it with a little bit of frustration. Um, the brand Hollister, California from, from Abercrombie is the typical California surf shop. This particular community is an agrarian community. Their high school mascot is the hay baler. So it could not be farther from a surf shop. So our color palette was all directly derived from the produce that they grew right there in Hollister. 
Uh, you see here the logo set up with this kind of snarky tagline, Hollister the original. We created a, a downtown variation, the opposite of a mall. Again, kind of, you know, putting ourselves into it. And and you, I told you their mascot is the hay baler. We launched a whole weekend excursion campaign, the perfect place to bail. These ads were run in the San Francisco market, getting people to come for a weekend getaway. Um, so you can kind of see the exploring the wine country. Uh, if you know anything about Abercrombie and Fitch, you've probably seen the black and white topless photos of, of male um, ads. You know, we, we decided to play with our own original Hollister model. So we took people from the community and rolled them in. Uh, so it's kind of a fun way to tell that story. Um, Beaufort, South Carolina, again, the highlights there. Typical logo mishmash, everything all mixed together. They do win points for having both a jogging shrimp and a saxophone playing crab. Uh, but other than that, very little continuity. Um, they also are close to Beaufort, North Carolina. So when you have two communities in two Carolina states with the exact same name, it was amazing how many times we heard stories of people that showed up in the wrong community. Um, here you see the, the word type that we came up with for them. Um, you can see this interesting position statement, historic downtown Beaufort established before Savannah, discovered before Charleston. We wanted to position their prominence in the, the historic region of North Carolina, and I mean, South Carolina and Georgia, um, created all the different brand adaptations and uh, showed how those logos got redesigned to fit into this slightly classier uh, system, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, by the time Savannah was founded, we were already old enough to drink. Uh, they loved that concept. Um, a lot of Forrest Gump was filmed right there in downtown Beaufort, and in fact, Tom Hanks fell in love with this local chocolate shop called the Chocolate Tree, and the box of chocolates that he was eating on the square in Savannah was actually a box from the, the Chocolate Tree. And then final, uh, Buena Vista, Virginia. If you see the name, you might think that it's Buena, but in Virginia, they pronounce things wrong to know whether you're a Yankee or not. Uh, Buena Vista, Buena Vista was, was developed in the mid 1800s as an industrial master plan community right on the river. Um, and even their name just means good views. It's not great views, it's not amazing views. So we just created this very simple brand system for them. But the thing that really stuck out was this amazing sign. Uh, Welcome to Buena Vista, 6,002 happy citizens and three old grouches. And if you notice, this sign has been up since 1971. We're almost 40 years of the sign being around. And we decided to take those three old grouches and turn them into the ambassadors for the community. Three out of three grouches agree. What are we supposed to be looking at? Persnickety about golf. It was this great way to just kind of take yourself and, and take yourself out of the picture and, and be funny and, and just be, be happy, you know? And I love uh, even seeing some communities across the country that have taken off that idea. And um, with that, you know, we're coming to the close. I could go on for days and days because I have so many things that I love to share, but I would love to open it up for any final questions. Um, I, I know we were able to hit a couple as they came in, but hopefully you saw some ideas today that, that kind of spurred the creativity. You saw some best practices of ways that, that systems should look and maybe some things that you don't need to necessarily invest in, but uh, love to entertain any final questions before we wrap for the day. Oh, you're, you're muted, Carol. Hey. Oh, I hear you now. Yeah. Uh, 